Uh, my name is Joe Bielart. I live about 15 miles south of Portland, Oregon. I've lived in this area virtually continuously since I got out of the Marine Corps in 1975. And I spend probably more time in the mountains and on the shore and the, in the rivers than most people. I, uh, I used to hunt. I gave that up. I fish. I still fish. I like to fish for Andromedus, the salmon, steelhead, and cutthroat trout. I hike. I like the night sky, so I, especially in the mountains, I stay up late at night. And that, in turn, staying up late at night in the mountains is uh, part of what uh, brought me to interest in Bigfoot. Uh, after some many years, I wrote this book, Oregon Bigfoot Highway, which is a detailed study of the history of a 70-mile stretch of forest road between Estacada and Detroit, Oregon, in the upper Clackamas. My co I'm, I'm, the, I'm actually the writer and the typist, the clerk typist on this. My co-author was Cliff Olson, who lived in the upper Clackamas at the Portland General Electric site for 13 years, plus years. And so he introduced me to Forest Service people, Portland PGE employees, and assorted loggers and other forest people that normally would not talk. So I asked him to become a co-author so his name would be on a book. And as a result, I got some very fascinating stories from them. The, uh, the book's been out for some some years. I'm in a revision of it right now. In this book, I don't examine the paranormal that we've heard of, perhaps experienced. Uh, the next book will include some of that aspect of these beings. Well, I never really paid much attention to Bigfoot until one, I, our family farm southwest of Corvallis is at the edge of the uh, forest. You can go through solid forest from there to the coast, 40 miles away, air miles away. And one uh, Christmas afternoon late, myself and two nephews, we were very young at the time, went for a drive looking for deer and had the usual 15 second sight, roadside sighting that's so often mentioned. Uh, the thing was balled up in a root mass, stood up and looked at us, thoroughly annoyed. I was only about, uh, 20 to 30 feet away. I had a full-size Bronco. The headlights were on because it was almost dark and uh, stepped out of the blowdown in two steps, which was a feat in itself, and walked into the forest. I basically, I told the boys it was a big bear. I didn't even want to really think about it until I accidentally came across Ray Crow's bookshop in North Portland, we had a branch near there, and I was up visiting the branch and uh, stopped in d downtown St. John's, and Ray Crow had some Bigfoot books for sale in his, his newsletter, and I made him mad because I wouldn't tell him who I was. Or I bought a Bigfoot book for $50, which was the biggest sale that he probably had ever had. And uh, I bought, I'd buy copies of the newsletter when I was up in that area. And then I bought a couple other, like Rene de Hinden's book. And finally he says, why are you interested in this? He got really irritated with it. And who are you? And I told him, and, and uh, he says, well, come to some of our meetings. So that's my introduction to organized Bigfooting was Ray Crow's Western Bigfoot Society meetings. And... I still don't go to a lot of meetings. I, uh, I generally, I have turned down numerous speaking requests if they aren't in the local area. I don't want to travel to talk about this stuff. I have spoken like eight times at the Carson, uh, the Home Valley event. And uh, they always invited me back, so I must have done something right. And then uh, they discontinued that event and turned it into Log Fest, which is a Logtoberfest, which is a really nice gathering. 
I spend a lot of time up in the woods. Like I say, uh, in part of it was uh, working with with uh, Cliff Berrickman's expeditions in 2017, 18, and 19. In 2018, I spent 22 nights in the woods. I think 15 of those were with Cliff's expeditions as a featured guest. Uh, in 2019, I was down to 19 nights out, and I think 12 of those were at Cliff's gatherings. Uh, those gatherings were extremely pleasing to me because first I could talk, and I like to hear myself talk. I find myself very entertaining. Uh, and I met people uh, from literally from brain surgeons, and one of the guests that was most important was Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum from Idaho. He and I knew each other by emails and by telephone conversations, but he had never, he had a copy of this book, but he never read it. And he, he'd look through it, but Jeff has a lot of stuff to read as a college professor, so I didn't feel slighted by that in the least. And then he told me, I explore territories. This book is based on about a thousand square miles, broken into six territories, separated by ridgelines and waterways. It so happens that one of his base theorems, theories is, these things live in roughly 1,000 square mile areas, and there are territories within those, within that major area, with females, five to six females, and assorted younger animals, one roving male, and occasionally a Bigfoot walking through the territory. So in effect, what I had done was perform a blind test of his theory. So for two nights, he spent a considerable amount of time with me going over this book and comparing his theory with what was actually in print. Okay, That's, uh, That was one of the biggest rewards I had working with Cliff, of course, just meeting people from across the country. And uh, they did wonderful things, like one fellow sent me uh, an absolutely stunning set of aerial photographs for me to work with as uh, in the research areas. So that's some of my days up the hill. Uh, mostly though, when I'm up there alone, or I used to go alone quite often until uh, my wife decided that wasn't such a healthy thing. Uh, she used to travel, so I was able to uh, load up and go up, and that was that. But the biggest thing is to, uh, to stay awake at night because that way you can observe the night sky. Sometimes the forest is absolutely dead. Sometimes, I mean, deadly quiet. It's, it's frightening in a way. Um, then, uh, and then some nights the forest is alive. It generally has to do with phases of the moon. But watching the night sky, my little telescope, and then we found out that with proper enticements, offerings, we used to call it baiting, we should change that to offerings, occasionally one of these things would come into camp. That led to my second sighting, and this one was more important. I was with a, he, he, he's, a very, he's a very intelligent man. He was a registered engineer with the state of Oregon. He made a he had a very high pressure engineering job in the wastewater treatment business. My first sighting was Christmas Day, 1993. I actually uh, grew up until I was 15 and a half in north central Nebraska, up near the South Dakota line on, a, on what would be termed a ranch. We had plowed ground, so it was a farm too. Uh, we were so far out that we had no television until I was 13 years old, simply because there was, there was no transmitter. Uh, we didn't have a telephone line at all because the phone company's line stopped a couple miles away and they wouldn't run it out to a single ranch. 
those were the days that I learned to be outside at night because at night out there, there was the coyotes and the deer coming into the haystacks and chasing them out of the cornfield. And it was, it was very pleasant at night to, to go out in the shelter belt and watch the owls. And it was, uh, I learned to enjoy the night then. In the Marine Corps, you get to learn to enjoy the night in a somewhat different way, but, uh, but it's uh, a lot of night work. And then when I was 15 and a half, my folks decided to move to Oregon. My dad got allergic to something that was to something. And uh, so we moved to a small ranch out there. We had only had about 40 or 50 head of cattle out in, in Oregon. We all worked out. And again, I was outside. Now I had trout to fish for. And I had salmon. My first salmon was the first fall we were here. Uh, and then I took up deer hunting and without spotlighting or road hunting, I was quite successful at it. I always gave them a sporting chance. And I filled, uh, I filled quite a number of our uh, family licenses and ag permits. Uh, so that was some of my outdoor experience. I discovered hiking really when I was in the Marine Corps and then I kept it up once I got out in the mountains here. Uh, when I was a youth, I didn't hike so much, but I was a runner, I'd, I'd run the roads or walk the roads. That's, uh, that's some of my ba outdoor background. Again, the major part was, was I had, even out here, we had only one TV station we could receive. And there were six kids, mom and dad, and grandma was with us a lot. So a lot of times the programming that was chosen was reasonably boring for me, so I'd be outside. Uh, that's pretty much how I developed my interests in uh, plants, trees, to some degree bugs. Uh, and I never really, really care too much for snakes, but they're there, you know. Oh, I started out in Florida, and then I went to Texas, and then I spent... Uh, two years out in the Hawaiian Islands. And from the, and while I was at two and a half years, when I was in the Hawaiian Islands, I went as far out as the Philippine jungle to the west and as far east as uh, Rhode Island for some special class work that they sent me to. Uh, so I, 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 and then I came back to uh, Meridian, Mississippi for my last two years which was again a great place to fish. I mean, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of bass fishing in that area. It's good, good times, a lot of snakes, a lot of snakes there. You know, anyway, that's where I served. Uh, well, after I had the sighting, I didn't really want to, anything to do with the phenomena. Basically, I wrote it off as a, as, a, as a naked hermit wandering around the forest. I didn't want anything to do with it. And then I did bump into Ray Crow's bookshop and started buying some books and reading them. My first book that I bought was John Green's uh, book, and it happened to be a hardbound. And it was, uh, had a real nice dust cover on it, which I took extremely good care of. That book later went to a really rich guy in the Seattle area via a bookseller. So I slowly developed an interest in these, in these creatures and I found the people that were going to his meetings tended to be pretty responsible people and not a bunch of kooks. So it, it was kind of fun to go and to hear something different. And I, I've sat through, uh, I've got a master's degree. You know, I've sat through university classes till I could scream. Uh, but, uh, and I was working towards a PhD so, you know, I, I, it was a pleasant diversion to go listen to lectures on something that was fanciful, actually. I've got an MBA and I've got a BS uh, with, with primarily in business, but I studied statistics because uh, statistics are the basis of business. And I spent a lot of time with uh, statistical analysis, which also led to something interesting that I did after I got to looking at Bigfoot. 
was I ran a statistical analysis of, I wanted to know how many Bigfoots there were in the Pacific Northwest from mid, from Southern Alaska down to Northern California. Pretty simple question. John Green, I think, estimated him about 3,500. What I did was run an analysis of Aboriginal peoples or tribal peoples in the Arctic, in Africa, the South Pacific Islands, and the Amazon, where they had small populations, but yet had a sustainable pop continuing pop population of hominid, of humans, part of the hominid group. Uh, I came up, amazingly enough, independently with about 3,500 individuals in the uh, Pacific Northwest down to California. Uh, yet another person, and I can't remember who that was, their estimate was a, a little over 3,000. And that was also a learned it was a professor, I can't remember, it might, might have been Roderick Sprague. So what we're looking at is a very rare phenomena in the forest. And you have to, and I cannot emphasize this enough, you have to look and identify a territory and repeatedly go to that territory to have any luck of encountering one of these things or having an encounter of some kind a vocalization, of finding a footprint, and even more rarely, a, a uh, sighting. One of the thing, one of my principles is that I work with is the Hukin Sullivan principle, that you have to spend 200 hours, foot feet on the ground, in a reasonably good area, to have one, to have an encounter of any kind, or possibly a sighting. Jim Hukin was a state of Oregon biologist. He's retired now. Jack Sullivan was a science teacher in the North Marion School District. These guys knew their stuff and they were very active from the late 60s up through the early 90s. They uh, each, I can't remember, one claimed 12 sightings, the other one claimed 13. But they all had the same characteristics of sightings. They were very brief. They were very clear, they knew exactly what they were seeing, and they did not have a time to raise their cameras up, or if they did get their camera up, it was, in too, dark, it was too dark to take a decent picture. Uh, and they refused to engage in blob squatch, which blob squatching is uh, these goofy pictures that people have of, of Bigfoot that are shadows and, and branches waving and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, that's uh, defining a territory <clears throat> and then going back to that territory and spending your 200 hours is uh, what I tell people they have to do. And in the Oregon Bigfoot Highway, again, I, I describe a one th a roughly a 1,000 square mile area with six well-defined territories in it. And there have been repeated sightings in each one of those territories. And we use seven different spots we've selected over the years re to repeatedly go up and try and have something happen. Most of the time, nothing happens. You spend all night and you enjoy the evening. You have a good, good supper, have a few drinks, enjoy the night sky, and that's it. Uh, occasionally you'll hear a coyote howl or you can entice them to howl which I don't you know that's that's bothersome so you can hear the night hawks diving people continually especially new to the mountains people listen to night hawks diving they're they go after these big insects that hatch at night and their wings get transonic and they go okay I've had, had to tell people numerous times, uh, especially on, on cliffs expedition where they come out and they have very little mountain experience, that these things are in fact birds, not Bigfoot roaring a long ways away. They're birds and they're fairly close to you. Cornell University has the Mulcahy Library 
of animal sounds. And most of those sounds are produced or recorded by biology graduate students or the like. So they've got verifiable sources. You can listen to a hundred different ways that, that deer vocalize. You can listen to elk, the many sounds that elk make. You can listen to cougars. You can also listen to nighthawks, although the nighthawk recordings that they have are not very good. I mean, I've actually made better recordings than what's on, on their library. But that library has hundreds of thousands of sounds, and in the, win the cold winter months when you're stuck at home and you don't want to watch the, the silver screen, uh, you can sit there and listen and learn a lot about what you're doing. For instance, we have seven different types of owls, in some areas eight types of owls in the in the Cascade Mountains in our area. You should be able to, I encourage people, you should be able to know the basic sounds that each variety of those owls make, because they can be confusing. Uh, so the Mulcahy Library of Animal Sounds at Cornell University is something I cannot overemphasize as a resource. What's the deal with the horses? That is a good question. Uh, I've never been a horse person. I don't particularly like them. They burn a lot of hay. They burn twice as much hay as a cow. And uh, you got tractors to do the work, and they don't, tractors don't kick. They will run over you, but they don't kick. Uh, but horses were a mainstay of, of, of human life in, the, in, in North America, well, obviously for, for for many thousands of years across the, across the earth. Animals in the forest, and Bigfoot is one of them, Sasquatch is one of them, learns to appreciate horses. There's a, uh, let's start off with, they seem to like horses. They, in, in Dmitry Bayanov's book, In the Footsteps of the Russian Snowman, he describes a farmer from a, his hay mound watching a, a Almasti come in and braid his horse's manes. At Lametti Butte one night or one day, we were talking to some horse camp people, and they, she especially complained that something was braiding their horse's manes at night and scaring them, incidentally. Uh, and they didn't know what it was, and I, I, declined, I didn't tell her about what I'd heard about Bigfoots. Bobby Short's book has an excellent picture of a, a, horse, a horse with braided manes. And in Bobby Short's book, I have a good friend, he, she talks about Don Monroe. Don Monroe is a resident of Montana, He's been investigating Bigfoot for many years. He's an authority on caves. He was looking into braided manes for Bobby. Uh, to his surprise, he found out it was a common occurrence on Montana ranchers to have these finely done braids in horses, and they didn't know what was happening, why it was happening. In one ranch, and I've got the quote here. I'm not going to bore you with reading out of a book. But basically, Don went down to to this ranch, they had 138 head of stock horses, uh, horses they rode to as a huge ranch, a Turner-sized ranch, uh, that they rode to take care of their cattle and all kinds of other things. And 40 of those horses had had braided manes, and not only were they braided, they were finely braided, and, and the manes were extended with by, tw by 14 inch hairs out of the horse's tail. And they, they had 40 such instances of that, and these were so tightly braided, the only way they could remove them was to cut them off with scissors. Horses, I've also know of, of a place where a group of horses, a little herd of horses, there was like six of them, would go to this one spot out in the forest and just stand there and mill around and then return to their pasture land. And this was out in the Oregon Coast Range. Something was attracting them 
and wanted to be near them. And it very well could have been a resident Bigfoot in that part of the coast range. Because Bigfoots are all over the coast range because there's Andromeda salmon runs. There's salmon and steelhead runs. There's a lot of food out there. Plus it's mild weather for most of the year. There's uh, <clears throat> several other references to braided horse manes. But on the other hand, Bigfoot likes horses as a, and is documented as a food source. Bobby Short's book goes into this in some extent, where uh, Bigfoot's apparently broken a horse's neck and has eaten upon the remains. Uh, there's at least one, at least one report in Bobby Short's book. I think several others. Uh, Bobby Short was a tremendous researcher. She died way too soon, and her book is still her behavior book is available on the internet through Bigfoot Encounters. I hardly re recommend you read both volume one and volume two, but they're still in draft form to a certain degree because she d departed us before she could finish them. Yes, horses are animal, are, are food occasionally even for humans. Uh, back in the uh, 70s, they tried to develop Horse meat as an alternative to beef, not without much success. It's pretty tough, I guess. But Lewis and Clark, in the Lewis and Clark journals, there is one odd, extremely odd entry. And they crossed a rocky area, obviously in the Rocky Mountains, or perhaps it might have been in, in what is now eastern Washington, where they went for seven days and all they found was roots to eat. There was the deer were gone, and the native the natives told them that the the inhabitants of this area were very fierce, and if they had the opportunity, they, they would take Lewis and Clark's horses and and turn them into into snacks. So that's that's an entry from a long time ago that's a pretty reputable group of people. Uh, so the, the, the liking of horses is partly to the good side and curious side and partly as a food source. I couldn't even, I, do I have a theory about why they would braid horses, horses' manes? I couldn't, I, ha, I have spent like, I have absolutely no idea why that might be. I'm sorry, but I, uh, there are certain aspects of these creatures' behavior that I, I haven't spent any time, time thinking about. There are some, bra some horse or some tree breaks and twists that are odd. But I, as I, there, the, in, the, in the Mount Hood National Forest, there are billions, literally billions, of broken branches. They're caused by all kinds of stuff. So occasionally you may find a, 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 a trunk or something of that nature that's been, that's been twisted and braided by a, a Bigfoot, probably as a territorial sign. Cliff Berrickman has such a thing they took out just this last year. My friend, my great friend and fellow researcher, Steve Kiley, who is unfortunately also no longer with us, he found a scotch broom. A scotch broom trunk is a, a tightly woven vine, so it's not like wood. And that, that scotch broom had been twisted apart like that. It would take, I, I put it on a device in the shop and a, a, a section of, and I, at 2,000 foot pounds, I still hadn't broken that thing. It's not a comparable test, and but we did have that piece of, 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 of broken, and it was tossed in front of a trail. We think it was a territorial marker. I gave it to Ray Crow. Ray Crow sold his entire collection to uh, an outfit in California, and unfortunately that went along, and I think they disposed of all those example exhibit items. Um, so that was lost to us. I really wish we would have kept that to ourselves. That uh, basically, I tell people, 
And I believe, firmly believe, that very, very little breakage can truly be attributed to, to Bigfoot. I, I've hiked up to it. It's basically a group of, you know, of trees that are put over a very large stump from the old days when they had the big virgin timber back there. And it's, a, it's like rafters. And at one time, it was covered up with fairly fresh boughs. It took me a huge amount of time to figure this out, but finally I thought, you know, that's a birthing structure. You know, some place where they could have a baby and be somewhat protected and out of sight. The only other structure that I found that I would even remotely attribute to Bigfoot, and I do, because Todd Neese found it with me when we were up in the Upper Cascades, and it's a, it's a grouping of trees that are teepeed, for lack of a better word, against a much bigger tree. And he is close to six feet tall and was able to stand up underneath it. There's a game trail that runs right adjacent to it. It could have been a shelter or a hide for a game trail. Most other shelters are Boy Scouts, survivalists, accidents of nature. Uh, I the only, the only shelter thing that I have heard of that, that I don't know about, but I can't think of any other reason, was that Cliff Berrickman's North American Bigfoot Center has gotten two reports this year after the great fires of, of Bigfoot crossing. This happens to be, both of these happen to be on State Highway 35 on the east side of Mount Hood, up near the top, or in that general area. One of them was near Sher what's called Sherwood Campground. The Bigfoot was carrying a large stump, a piece of cut wood, probably from a logging site, and was struggling and had, a, it was so big and huge a piece of wood, it was struggling to get across the road. The other sighting was very similar and in the very same area. My feeling is, is that they were functionally starting to build themselves a log cabin as a new, uh, you know, they're dislocated by the fires. They could put the stumps down, build around it, stack rocks up around it, and then have their own little cave. That's the, I cannot think of any other reason why a Bigfoot would be carrying a very large stump or, or, or piece of uh, timber. Uh, but other than that, I, uh, there's one uh, overhang that might be used as a shelter for them up on Mount Hood. Uh, I've a law enforcement officer, a United States Forest Service law enforcement officer, told me and Cliff Olson, Cliff was a good friend of his, about a mine shaft, a deserted mine shaft that he watched repeatedly because there was the grass around it and the gravel around it was worn down from repeated entry and exits. So uh, mine shafts possibly might be there, a uh, 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 abode. Uh, there's all kinds of lava tubes. In Rob Alley's uh, Alaska book, his first one, Raincoast, Big, uh, Raincoast Sasquatch, he describes a fella going inside of a lava tube and encountering one of these things that was sleeping in there, sitting in a sitting position and sleeping and he uh, beat feet out of the old lava tube I'm, I might say. Rob Alley's books, Rob Alley was a uh, physical therapist and he traveled around to the various islands helping people so he got some really really good reports for both Raincoast Sasquatch and now for his Bigfoot in Southeast Alaska of these things doing everything from, from stealing deer for food to uh, watching people sleep. A family of them was watching two people sleep in a car at a, at a remote campground. And they woke up and here's three big feet looking down at them in the moonlight. Uh, again, that's because he was in contact with them, they got to know him, and he did a service to them, and they gave him a little reward when he asked. Jim is a really ardent outdoorsman. He doesn't, he doesn't, he really doesn't hunt and fish, but he hikes a lot. And uh, 
he's not a night night sky observer, but he he was walking along up in Saddle Mountain 30 years ago, and he falls through a roof, and and he lands on in a room that was unfurnished, that had no bones in it, but was covered in soft nesting type material. And he recognized, and it, it, the roof was about uh, this room, this constructed room, which was constructed against a hillside, against some tree roots. He said, I, he vaulted out of it. And he, thinks it he thinks the opening was about nine feet above him. He was, he was whatever was coming home, to, he wanted to be out of there. He didn't go out through a side entrance. He went out, up. Somehow he got up and out. That reminds me of another, uh, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't a boat, but Todd and East were, I were up there in March of, uh, about March of 2000, to the south of Saddle Mountain. And Todd found a, a rock that I could crawl under, and it was all nice and clean underneath, and it was a very large rock, and the entrance was easy for me to get in and out of, just and it was obviously someone's shelter, and it wasn't a coyote or something because there wasn't any bones or trash or whatever in it. And he also in that area found an entrance into a uh, berry vine, a very large berry vine, blackberry vine uh, bush. And it was like an entrance into an Eskimo's cabin where you, there was, it was pretty big, you could, I could crawl through it very easily. Todd's a little bigger than me, and he could. And you entered again a, a room that was had nice, soft sleeping spots on it, and the top was covered up with boughs to shed rain. So that could have been a shelter, although there was no associated tracks with it. But something made that thing. And uh, blackberries are really nasty to work with. Oh. The producer just asked me about Devil's Trails. He's read my book a little too closely, I'm afraid. But Devil's Trails, we found five of these things and uh, in the upper Clackamas. And basically, a grown man can walk through them standing up and have very little contact. And generally, they're taller than, uh, the opening is taller than, than a, a six-foot person. And they tend to parallel game trails. And they're, we've never found tracks in them, but something has constructed them and uses them. We're up to five. There's one up by uh, Indian Henry. There's one over by Mount Mitchell. There's one up by Tarzan Springs. There's one over by the headwaters of the Warm Springs River. And I can't remember where the other one was. Cliff and I were out. And the first one we found was under Mount Mitchell. And we just called it the Devil's Trail. So that's, that's how it got its name. Well, <coughs> offerings are basically baiting. That's how they started. We started baiting these things. Now, the easy thing to do is to bait with a salt block. Uh, gives them minerals and it gives them salt, but every other every other animal in the forest likes salt blocks too. Uh, also, God help you if the Forest Service people, game warden finds out you're doing this. Uh, but uh, we started putting out uh, all course uh, cabbages, apples, all sorts of fruits and vegetables, and occasionally we would. They would all, most of them are eaten by birds, ravens, elk, deer, bears, and various rodents. But occasionally we, we can surmise that one is eaten by a Bigfoot. A person that's very connected to these creatures and claims the, uh, a mental ability with them told us, me and Cliff, Cliff and I, to not call it baiting, to call them offerings. First off, it put a better aura over the aura, over the offering. 
and uh, we weren't baiting animals. We were making offerings to a to the forest people. So then we started calling them offerings. We oftentimes use tarts. I started putting out uh, fruit pies and stuff like that that you'd buy at the store. One day my wife came home early from work and she found a some kind of bake-it-yourself pie that I bought at, at one of the big stores. I can't remember one of the names that you see. And she goes, what are you doing? Are you eating pie at home? And I go, no, I, I don't really care for pie, actually. And she goes, why do you got this pie here, and why are you baking it? She'd come home early. For, that's a sure, sure recipe of, for trouble when they come home early. I said, well, I'm going to offer it to the... Uh, to our barefoot friends, which is a Kylie term. He, he coined barefoot friends. And uh, she goes, she looks at it and she goes, you can't feed that to them. I mean, she, she didn't like Bigfooting at all at the time. But at, she identifies, she grew up on a ranch, small ranch, and she identifies with horses and with cattle and other farm animals and takes care of them. And she said, look at this. And she gave me there's the usual three P's in there, phosphorus, phosphate, I don't know, these, these preservatives and stuff. And she says, I'll bake you something. And she had some leftover older plums, I think it was. So she made me some tarts. And then she started making, it amused her immensely that we would set these things out and that maybe some of them were eaten by Bigfoot, even though the bulk of them were eaten by the aforementioned bear, elk, deer, ravens, and small rodents who made a mess. Anyway, uh, we'd set out tarts. And uh, this led to an even more bizarre situation. Tobe, you're familiar with Tobe, he had a conference up in outside, about 40 miles in the mountains to the east of uh, Eugene, Oregon. And people came from all over, including one gentleman from who I'm still in touch with in New Jersey. And he had some really great speakers. But one night the speaker was so, the place was packed, and so this fellow and I sat outside on the porch, and I was drinking a beer. And he said, Joe, he says, uh, he, he'd talked to me several times by then, he said, Joe, do you believe these things can give messages to people, to have connections? And I go, well, I've heard that. I, I know of one lady that I'm sure has that connection just from what she said over the years. And he says, well, a person that has that connection back east says they're missing their tarts. And I go, I was so shocked, I actually blew beer out my nose. They're missing their tarts. This came from a fella in New Jersey visiting this conference. And at the time, only three people knew that we were putting out tarts. Tom Powell, the author and science teacher, me and Sharon. And uh, I figured Tom put him up to it. But Tom said no, and he, he says no, but, uh, he, and he said no as recently as about a year ago. But uh, I don't know what that means, but anyway, they miss their tarts. Which brings me up to, I'm going to show you some stuff here. Yeah. We're going af af back after offerings, um, and probably one of the most successful offerings we've ever had is boiled corn with salt. And we bought, we bought, uh, we've been buying ears of corn with hus and a, and a, a stem on them. And then boiling them, and we think that butter turns rancid. They don't tend to eat them, or it, only the birds and, and, and deer will try and mess with them. But we had, we've had excellent results when they're in the right area and when we put out boiled corn with salt. 
And in 2018, in one of our favorite spots, one night a one of these beings came in and ate two complete corn cobs off and two mostly off. And here is what they did. It looks just like a human would eat it. And although the husks are still on, you can still see they didn't snap off the base. Now, a bear, when it eats a, co a corn cob, it just eats it all. I mean, it just goes woof it down. Uh, ravens peck at it and scratch at it and make kind of a mess. Deer worry it and will, they'll eat it all eventually, but you can tell they'll take chunks out of the cob. Um, and elk are a little better at it, but, uh, and th that's what mainly gets the corn, is, is those, those type of animals. Occasionally rodents will get at it if, if nothing else does for some reason during the first night. You cannot set out offerings during the day. I once decided in my infinite wisdom to set out offerings up about a, there's a long, long quarter mile stretch, a straight road at a slope, and I decided I would set out offerings in four different points going up that slope and sit there and watch and see what I could see at night with my night vision. Uh, I put out the first offering and the second offering, and then by the time I put out the third, I noticed the ravens were on the first one. I put out the fourth, and then they went to the second offering, and I can't remember what I was even using right then. Uh, and then they went up to the third offering, and then they flew around over my head because I was too close to the fourth offering, and they wanted me to leave so they could eat it. That's what normally gets these things. But notice this. These are eaten completely around, two of these completely eaten as a human would eat them. And I can guarantee you a human did not eat them. Okay, there's two that are completely done. And over the years, with being this being over two years old, uh, the husks are starting to dry up, but the basic stem is still on here. You gotta have the stem on there so they can grab a hold of it. Here is one with the, with the hair still on it that's, you can see how it's been eaten and squarely eaten. And again, the parts that have been eaten are smooth. The ends are not pecked at. No bear is going to do this, I can assure you. There was one even better than this that I told my friend, Dr. Hart, that I had, and he said he knew a guy, a gentleman, who did DNA analysis for the government and for high-level science. And he said, I will arrange for you to send him that other corn cob and have him look at it for DNA analysis. Uh, we were considering doing one of the $1,500 DNA things, but uh, this was an opportunity not to be missed. So I sent it to the lab, which was in Texas. Didn't think much more about it. I thought they'd probably just ignore it. But about three weeks later, the head of the laboratory calls me here at the house and talked to me for over 20 minutes. He wanted to know every single detail about how that corn cob was obtained and the circumstances around it. Uh, and then he chastised me heartily for not, not, not preparing my sample bags correctly and for putting it in a refrigerator instead of a freezer. Uh, if you really want to get good DNA, you got to start, believe it or not, with latex gloves before you even touch anything else. And then you select bags, you have latex gloves, uh, to, uh, to handle them thereafter and then you freeze it, the stuff. I, I had, this stuff was in, in a grocery bag, a small grocery bag, 
in the refrigerator. So anyway, I sent him this stuff, and, and his parting shot was, he said, well, first off, he said, for us to do a real DNA test on this, it'll cost you thirty-five dollars to $40,000. And I go, well, that ain't going to happen. And he says, oh, I know you can't afford that. And he says, also, in the end, he says, all that you'll really find out that it's 96% human or mainline hominid uh, DNA, and then there will be about 4% of other, he just said 96% hominid, common hominid DNA. And I thanked him, and I appreciated the advice, and I, that was it. And then I looked, it up, I looked him up, and it turned out to be the head of the lab, the guy, that, the main guy, the, 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 the chief. And then I was duly impressed by what he did. And as a parting gesture, he says, uh, do you want me to send this back, this cob back to you? And I said, no. I said, you guys can keep it. You can keep it. And he says, we, we will appreciate that. He said, we. And I remember that. Then since I'm a little slow, I mean, I am getting older, and I never have been really fast. Uh, I go, 96%. Why would he say 96% unless he ran a basic DNA test? Those people tested that, and they knew what they had, and that is why they were so happy that I gave them that corn cob as a sample. And fortunately, in 2019, we weren't near where they were when we put out corn samples. 2020, the year of the COVID, we did very little outside work. This year, we'll be putting out corn again. But remember, the territories. You've got to go into the territories and be in a territory within that territory where they're at at the time. Otherwise, some other animal will get it. That's why it's so absolutely important to do what Jeff Meldrum says. Look at your 1,000 square miles, break it down into... Uh, territories, and then go to likely spots in there and repeatedly do it again and again. And that's, that's what we did before I even heard about Jeff's theory. Well, that's that. Oh, uh, one other thing that I really is really important is these things will occasionally leave a reward, for, especially for tarts. They seem to like those tarts. And Sharon uses... Uh, she. We pick berries, we, use, uh, we don't use organic berries, we just go out and pick regular berries. Uh, anyway, we put out tarts one night in what I call the big rock quarry, the head of the big rock quarry. And we put it out after dark, and we put it out about 200 yards away from our truck, because I didn't want a bear coming around and sniffing around. And in the morning, this tent stake bag, the, the, uh, the aluminum foil was there and the cellophane was there that the tart was on, but this was left in return. A tent stake bag that's like new. Now where they got this thing, I don't know. I was giving a presentation to a high school in southwest Washington and it turned out to be standing room only because they made it known that I was going to speak on Bigfoot. And when I produced this tent stake bag, I said, if you, kid, if you kids want to touch something that's been touched by a Bigfoot, I'll let you touch it because we can't do DNA on it. And I was astounded. They recoiled. As a unit, they just, like this, they just went back. They didn't want, and not a single one of them, a few of them would come up and look at it closer, but not a single one of them touched it. Anyway, uh, there was a major A number one sighting near that high school about two months ago that was reported to North American Bigfoot Center. I mean, it couldn't have been better. 1.30 in the morning, a guy coming home from work, worked at a brewery, the whole nine yards, a, a setback thumb, the screaming, the description. Again, though, Description has been done on these things until it's ad nauseum. We know pretty much what they look like and the range of what they look like. Uh, what we don't really know are their behaviors other than 
every report has a behavior, but they haven't been categorized and they haven't been, uh, except in my book. My book has an appendix that, that tr attempts to categorize them by diet, by aggression, by other topics. And then uh, Ray Crow jumped on that and he did the same thing with a bunch of his track record stuff before he passed on. And then Bobby Short was starting to do it and uh, on her volume two, 400 pages of uh, behaviors. That's what we need to do. We need to understand their behaviors well enough and get them to trust us well enough so that they will come in and communicate with us. That's what we need. And you can't do it just by wandering around looking for a photograph. We have got one associate, John Glenn, and the producers saw him talk. I believe he talked. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't speak at Beachfoot. In fact, he, he, he's very reluctant to get in front of crowds. But I think his quote was that he had me use was, uh, I just wish that she would come back and talk to me again. That's a quote from John Glenn. I just wish she would come back and talk to me again. We were at yet another of our favorite places, not where any of this stuff happened, in the upper Clackamas, and one came in and stood next to John's cot. He was sleeping outside, as you should. You should sleep outside so they can see you. And he said he didn't know what she, she was looking at him, as they are given to do. They will look at sleeping people. And he said, it's a beautiful night, isn't it? And where have you been for so long? And she replied in some guttural type of language. The only word he could really remember was quack, quack. And he is a professional diver. He's uh, 73 years old, tough as nails, former Marine. And he habitually looks at his watch when something happens because he's a diver. It's important to him to know. He talked to her for over 13 and a half minutes. And all he could do was say things like, talked about the weather, talked about how the nice was, night was. And she stood there and would reply to him. And, and she, he said they, she had a wonderful, nice voice. And then there was another one waiting in some big timber that made some noise and then she walked into the timber. So, there can be quite a bit done if you, uh, if you gain their confidence enough, they'll come around and look at you. I sleep in the back of a truck John's, or on a cot. John sleeps on an open cot. We, uh, we, uh, I've woken up with two inches of snow on me. It's all in how you prepare yourself and make a little head cover when you know it's going to snow or rain. Uh, but they will come and look at sleeping people. I was asleep in a tent, commonly called a cocoon, in my opinion, my lexicon. Uh, Sharon and I were about 30 feet away in a tent. If you're in a tent, 90% of the stuff that happens at night you are unaware of. Uh, I believe at Beachfoot you heard a gentleman give a short talk and about where he was in a tent and one actually reached in and, and grasped him by the head. Uh, he's been a long-term associate, a uh, very reliable guy. At tech. He's a electronics technician. Uh, he's, uh, he, know, he knows quite a bit about how to be near these things. I, I can go on with many more stories about how to attract them and what might happen. Uh, one thing we did with a one of my associates who is a registered engineer with the state of Oregon, and this is my second sighting. This, this film should not be about me. This is, this is nothing more than a descriptive talk for future researchers' use. He claims that when these things are near, and we have, he and I have camped out probably in the neighborhood of 20 times, um, he, he has all kinds of, some really expensive toys like thermal imagers and night scopes. I've got a basic night scope. 
Uh, it's actually pretty good. I bought it from the factory Krasnosk directly in Russia when I still could do that. Um, it's like a generation, low level generation two. It's a good scope. Uh, anyway, he claims that when they're near, he goes to bed early. He's only gone to bed early on me twice. He's a, he's a night owl. And that night he went to bed at about nine o'clock and it was a very picturesque setting of dabbling brook going by us uh, underneath big timber. Uh, just, just a wonderful setting. It's kind of, it's not an established campground, obviously. And about eleven, I went to bed about eleven o'clock, but I doused the fire. But the coals were still there; they still were giving off some heat, I guess. One came out. I heard it cross the creek. I was sleeping in the back of my truck, and it walked over by the fire pit, and stood there for a while. Probably, I don't know what it was doing. I just heard it standing there. And then it walked over and it st stood above above David, looking down at him. I assume it was looking down at him because it stood there for quite some time, watching him sleep. He was sleeping on the ground. And then it walked over to the end of my truck and stood a few feet at most off the end of my truck bed my truck bed is seven and a half feet long, so it was perhaps nine feet away from me, where my head was. And I saw it beautifully illuminated in the moonlight. It wasn't a big, it was more of a big, husky, strong man type size, approaching seven feet. But the face was very weathered, like an old weathered trapper or something. And... Uh, the moon was such that I could really get to see it. I, 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 I was, I didn't know what to do. Here's one of these things standing there looking at me. And I was looking back at it. And uh, it was not threatening at all, so I wasn't feeling safety problems. I had my 357 right here. I never even thought about touching it. Um, and then I decided it was trying to communicate with me that it was trying to send me a thought, send me some thoughts that was trying to communicate with me, and it was really trying. It's kind of like when your dog tries to communicate with you, and you know it's there, and you know it wants something, but it can't say the words. And I should have started talking to it to see if it would say anything, but finally, after certainly a long minute, if not longer, it turned around and walked off down the road. And the next morning I found the footprints where it left the road and crossed the uh, Forest Service Road where the dirt was and walked into the forest. Uh, so I think there's a possibility that there can be communication. Ron Moorhead in his book on Sierra Sounds has done voice recordings a uh, fellow named Scott, I can't remember his last name, he was a, he was a uh, translator for the U.S. Navy and goodness knows one of their secret agencies for 30 years. He claims they have a language, but they don't, we don't have a key word or two to develop what the language says. Sierra Sounds, Ron Moorhead, and Al Berry, both of which I've camped with and really enjoy Al's passed on to. We're getting old, this... The group of Bigfooters that I'm associated with are just simply aging. It's a younger crowd that I hope will learn from us in the future. My advice is, is to spend as much time outside as you can. At, stay awake at night. Don't sleep inside of a tent unless you have to for some reason. And... Uh, and don't put out offerings nearby because bears will come in and, and wreak havoc uh, and put out offerings after dark and try and try and get these things to communicate with you somehow but uh, and also save your money because no matter what anybody says bigfooting costs you at a minimum fifty dollars a night just for gas and supplies the way we do it, 
with a little beverage attached. It's about a hundred dollars a night. Plus, we go up, uh, we go, we drive deeper into the forest than the average person does. It's not unusual for us to drive for two to two and a half hours. I can drive into Skookum Meadows up in southwest Washington, Gifford Pinchot National Forest, because the roads are better and faster than I can to Pinhead Buttes in the Upper Clackamas. It's a, and, but when you get back out there, be careful because one night a f guy tripped, fell into a fire, total accident, not drunk or anything. We were three hours from the nearest hospital. I mean, you, when you get up there, and especially if you're alone, you better be damn careful. My opinion on paranormal or telepathy and things that have happened uh, there's been some bizarre things that have happened to us, and I can only use my, uh, my examples. The king, the absolute king of uh, paranormal and Bigfooting is Kwani Laproditis. And I like Kwani, and I really enjoy his books, and I enjoy talking to him. Uh, Kwani wrote the uh, Psychic Bigfoot and a couple others. Now that goes into paranormal pretty deep. Um, one of my associates that happens to be in this book, because she spends so much time in the upper Clackamas, she claims communication with them on a somewhat regular basis, far removed from, like she'll be at home and they'll tell her something. And uh, another f good, good friend of mine and he's also in this book. He says that once you make a connection with these beings, that they, and you're going up to visit them, if they want, they, they know when you're gonna leave the house and your intent. Now, he's part Native American. When a Native American person tells you something about Bigfoot, you better listen, because they ain't gonna say, they are not going to say much. And what they say is, Probably pretty straight on, good, the true gen. But uh, the only, I'll, I'll just give you two examples of telepathy and how that affected, and I don't believe either one of these examples, one might be in the book, but I'm not sure. Uh, Steve Kiley and I went up to the, up to the Colawars to an area, and there's two we stopped, and there's there's two cricks that come down in a V to enter the main fork of the Colorwash. I was to go on the creek on the north side of the V. He was to go on the creek on the south side of the V. We're going to meet up at a top above at a logging road, and then circle around on a logging road past Tom Meadow. And that's right, Tom Meadow, not Tom's Meadow. They oftentimes left off the apostrophe on their maps and back to the truck. We'd done this before. We had had, we'd had offerings taken up there. Uh, these things also seemed to like bicycle flashing red lights. We've had those taken. Anyway, uh, and Steve was armed with a 44 Magnum. I had my 357 Magnum. So we were, if we ran into a bear or something, we were pretty well prepared or aggressive cougar for some reason. Uh, the, the weapons were not to take a Bigfoot in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, we take off on our respective areas, and we're, even if we would have shouted, we would not have been able to hear each other. It was late May, the foliage was out, couldn't see each other, couldn't hear each other. We didn't have handheld radios. I found myself back at the truck by my watch in about 13 minutes. I had, and I, I didn't know why I was back there. All of a sudden, I was back at the truck after about 13 minutes walking, and it would have normally have taken me about an hour with the piddling around and looking for footprints and checking the blowdowns. And it's a magnificent area. It's, a cyclone went through there in a, in, in a 
big trees, big trees are blowing down like tiddlywinks. It's a very interesting area. But here I am back at the truck by my watch about 13 minutes because I timed myself when I left. And less than one minute later, here comes Steve walking down off his trail. And we look at each other and we throw our packs in the back of the truck and we drive off. Subsequently, I've measured the distance, the miles that we drove off in silence. It's about 12 miles to what's called the new grade where the washout of 96 was rebuilt. And I asked Steve, did you hear anything back there? And he said, yes. It said, leave here now. And I said, that, that's what I heard, leave here now. Now, whatever was up there had sent a message to both of us that was so compelling, or it had the ability to compel both up two grown armed men who had done that hike before several times and was familiar with the area to leave now. And we can only surmise that possibly there was a, we found a roughly 16 inch prints up there. And then we found some smaller ones that perhaps it had a baby, a young one. Another time we were up in the mountains and there was a total skeptic, and this was at the big rock quarry. And that night, there was a small group of them, and they were not barred owls. Go back to Mokei Sound Library Sound. Barred owls make the sounds like they're talking. It wasn't barred owls. And they were on three sides of the quarry. It's a very large quarry. And on one side, there's kind of a dirt, steep dirt filled slope, and it goes up to a cusp of trees, a little grove of trees. And uh, the one fellow was along, he was along for sightseeing purposes. The other fellow believed in these things. The, uh, the guy that I'm talking about, he, 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 he thought it was a fanciful tale. Anyway, these things start talking back and forth a little bit. And uh, one of the things was, was this thing is, this, this quarry is bigger and it's shaped rather like a football field. And I went to, uh, I had them build a big fire and I figured, well, we'd had some offerings taken there under unusual circumstances. Uh, I figured uh, maybe I'll see one walking between the fire and them. So I make a scotch and go clear up by the far end of the goal post at, far into the field. And uh, the voice that was in the copse of trees on the uh, north side asked a question, and it was extremely, it was obvious to us what it was, because they heard it too. Where did he go? Because it was dark. I mean, all I had was zodiac glow to illuminate my way. And But I knew the rock quarry, and I'd walked it before, and I knew the rock I wanted to sit on. And then one up behind me answered, like, he's here. And then the guy, the one in the cops of the trees goes, okay. So anyway, I go back to the fire eventually when I was finished up. Nothing had happened. And we start walking around the quarry. Now, the fellow that didn't believe at all, he gets... He gets antsy and edgy as we near the copse of trees up there. And he starts crawling up that slope on his hands and knees because it was steep. And he is crawling, trying to climb that slope. And this is a level-headed guy with a good position, and a creative position too, I might add. And finally, I had to tell his friend, you know, grab him. And so he grabs him and he continues to claw going up that slope. And he's making these guttural sounds. So I ended up crawling up there and getting dirty as hell. Uh, 
dirt down my shirt and pants. And we wrestle him back down to the bottom and kind of shake the hell out of him. And he kind of comes, he comes out of his trance. All I can tell you is, is that he was overcome by some compulsion to make him want to go up to that copse of trees. Now, what that compulsion was about, I couldn't possibly tell you. Anyway, that's just two, uh, two, wow. two, uh, two stories. I've only seen one, and it, oddly enough, it was only about two years ago, uh, and I, I flew airplanes for the Navy and Marines, okay? So I've seen a lot of night lights in the night sky. And I, most of them are meteors or on, head-on meteors or all kinds of things that cause lights in the sky. I have two associates, both in this book. One saw, and he saw a couple times, large blue orbs above the treetops in the upper Clackamas in an area that was, that was thought by, it was an area that I've been told by the Native Americans was an area they were superstitious of. And it was also an area where they placed their, buried their dead. But that, that he seen that light up there. Another fellow went into the bottom of, uh, of, of Roaring River, which is primeval. It's an absolutely untouched wilderness. It's never been burnt by accidental fires or per, you know natural fires or anything. It's it's the most primeval place that I've ever seen in the forest. And he has pictures of these little blue orbs flighting around. And he he is a 30-year science teacher. I mean, this guy is calm and level-headed and not given to and given the time of day since it's basically night He's not getting lens reflections and all that junk that can cause orbs. I had one, two reports of spaceships up there, um, but uh, the light I saw was at one of, again near the. It was at the camp, near the camp where John had his encounter, where he spoke to him, and the night before we got up there. An eerie light, it's right next to a ridge, and there's a valley down there. An eerie light went up the valley below the ridge and then perhaps entered, there's a big stone cliff face there. That's where they lost it. And it was yellowish, a yellow lime yellow light. And it made no sound at all. Uh, it was, there's no road nearby, so it wasn't a car light. Definitely, and it illuminated, made a, quite a bit of illumination, they said. So the next night, to go for our night walk, uh, Rich and I, one of the guys that were up there the night before, go for our night walk, and we're walking north on the, on the old, old logging road that's nearby. And again, we're looking down into the, that valley. And a light comes up the valley, making no noise. It's that lemon-colored light, uh, a little lime green maybe. And there's no noise, no object associated with it that we can see. And we watched it for on the, on the map, on the Google Earth, we watched it for over a mile from where we first saw it, and the people back at camp saw it too, and it goes up to the cliff face and disappears. Now, what that was all about, I don't know, but that's the only light that I've ever seen up there that really caught my interest. I like the meteors, the meteor shower, the big one, the Perseids. Actually, a Native American told me, and this is how I really got into the Perseids was um, 20 years ago, Native American told me to go up there in the, on a saddle, a high saddle, in the middle of August, and I might see at night what I was looking for, and that's when the Perseids are. They're on the 12th through the 14th 
most every year the peak is one of those days up in the and if you're up high enough you really get a good show high and dark it's the only light i've seen was that light that mysterious light going up that valley and it was it was majorly mysterious actually that's have i ever observed a sense of humor with them yes i have and i'm only going to give you this has happened a couple times in night encounters uh coming around at night uh, well sharon actually heard heard this better than i did uh, i'll save the best one for last so i'm going to give you just two examples one came into our camp up where we call it tarzan springs it's actually uh, sand lake but it's Tarzan Springs is just over the hill, and it feeds Sand Lake. But it's easy identifying, so we call it Tarzan Springs. And we've had several encounters there where it comes in at night. One night it took my walking stick, of all things. I was up there alone and took it into the forest, and I looked for it for about a, oh, I don't know, I probably looked for it for at least a half an hour before I found it along a trail up there, just because I was, I was curious where it might have gone. And it was anyway, uh, two, two year, 2019, I think it was. We're up there for the September, we have a gathering before hunting season, uh, which is the end of the Bigfoot season because you don't want to be out there when the rifles are going off, crawling around through the bush. Bad, bad move, bad move. Anyway, uh, so we're up there at the end of September, so that'd be the third week of September. And one comes out, and it normally comes out and does something when you're up there, if you leave offerings or whatever. And it rummaged around the kitchen, and we didn't leave anything out for it. Okay, so we had three ice chests lined up in a row, and, uh, and it woke Russ up in his tent, and it went through his kitchen looking for something to eat. Nothing there. And then it goes to the ice chest, and it opens each ice chest, and we didn't put anything on top like we should have, like some lettuce or something. And they were covered with ice, and so it opens one up, and it's disgusted, it slams it shut. Comes up to the next one, opens it up. Sharon's awake by now. Slams it, and then she's nudging me, and so I'm finally awake. And it gets to the third one, and that one doesn't have hinges at work. We secure the top with a bungee cord. And it, so it picks it up, and there's nothing there for it to eat. So it goes bang, bang, bang with that lid, and then walks off in the forest disgusted. <laughs> anyway, so leave them something to eat at night. I mean, come on. I mean, it could be a cookie. It doesn't matter what it is. Anyway, uh, I was at an, another spot one night, and uh, I'll, I'll boil it down to the, something was around camp. I didn't know whether it was a bear or whatever it was. Maybe, maybe one of our barefoot friends is possible because we had some things happen there. So I get in my truck and I go to sleep. Uh, there's quite a bit of story attached to this, but about, three in the morning on my truck and I'm asleep in the cab because I'm just asleep in the cab or I was sleeping there with the windows down that night. And about three in the morning I hear on the side of my truck just against the sheet metal, bang, bang, bang. And this thing had been screwing around with me all night long. And I figured, man, this is it. I'm going to take this guy on this time. Mano, oh, mano. So I jump out of the truck, and I had my slippers on. I could swear I heard it going off, see it go off through the moonlit forest with some kind of primeval laugh it was making that it finally got me to rouse me out, you know. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. Boy, nothing does that in nature, I'll tell you that. I can tell you that nothing would do that at 3 o'clock in the morning. If it was a bear looking to, for something to eat and leaning on the side of the truck, it would have scratched it. You know, 